Hi, this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. Our guest this week is back Gilbert, for a return. slow down. This is torture. Yes. <laughs> Have some fun with it. <laughs> Have fun, fun with, with it, Gil. <laughs> I've known you for years. <laughs> Read from the heart. <laughs> You want me to start crying in the middle of it? <laughs> I'm going to start crying. Yes. Our guest this week is back for a turn engagement on this podcast. Well, who could it be? Yeah, I don't know. All right, should we do it as a contest? <laughs> <laughs> He's a producer, director, writer, occasional actor, and one of the funniest, most fearless stand-up comedians of his generation. Ooh, it's going to be good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Yakov Schmier. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, yes. As, and as an actor, you've seen him in movies like American Dreams, National, I, cut this. <laughs> <laughs> National Security, The Adventures. You were in The Adventures of Rocky and Paul Winkle. Yeah. Boy, I couldn't even get into that piece of shit. <laughs> That's... That, that shows where my career is. You mean you is. couldn't get into it or you couldn't get into it? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, both. Yeah. Also, uh, <laughs> uh, along came Polly. I got cut out of that. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's the worst intro. We'll for, cut this out. The best worst intro I've ever had. Sorry. The, the Emojo movie. Emoji. The Emoji movie. <laughs> the TV show Swedes, Greg the Bunny, Children's Hospital, American Dad, Family Guy, the Simpsons, Sneaky Pete, and Crashing. He also co-wrote the screenplay for the recent feature, The Comedian. He said five years ago. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Starring Robert De Niro, Danny DeVito, and me, Gilbert Gottfried. And that's not all, my friends. You've also seen his memorable performances in the Comedy Central roast of everyone from Pamela Anderson to Bruce Willis. I've been in a few of those. And he starred in several of his own terrific specials, including Jeff Ross, Roast America, Jeff Ross, Roast Cops, Jeff Ross, Roast Criminals, Jeff Ross, Brazos County Jail. What was that? Uh, Brazos, Brazos, I don't know. Jeff Ross at, roast criminals live at Brazos County Jail. Live at Bra- <laughs> ah, fuck it. No one's paying attention. As well as the series Jeff Ross. This presents intro's longer than my career. <laughs> roast bottle. And roast bumping, bottle. bumping mics, which <laughs> bumping mics I was on. He got some of those right. Okay, co-starring our one-time podcast guest. Dave Attell, he's also the author of the very funny memoir, I Only Roast the Ones I Love, which I believe is still available from a Jamaican guy selling used books outside the Port Authority. (laughs) His brand new Netflix series is called Historical Roast. Yep. And also features yours truly in the role I was born to play Adolf Hitler. Please welcome back to the show a guy who never fails to make us laugh and a man who once asked Courtney Love if she gave free donkey rides to the bottom of her vagina. (laughs) I did say that. Our pal Jeff Ross. Wow, what great to see you guys. Thank you so much, (laughs) Jeff, for that beautiful introduction. I feel... So welcome. It felt like Gilbert was reading a hostage letter. <laughs> that's, about, that's about the size of all of his reads. Jeez. I forgot about some of those credits. Yes. I have stuff I'm way more proud of than the nonsense you mentioned. What would, yeah. you, what would you like to mention that you're more proud of? You're, um, you're proud of those, those, uh, those roast specials, the cops, the, the prison one. The I am. Those I love very much. Yeah, I watched the one you did at the border, which was great. Oh, yeah. Jeff yeah. Ross roast the border. Very touching. I went down to uh, the southernmost part of of America, yeah. Brownsville, Texas. Texas. Yeah, yeah. And I roasted immigrants as they crossed into America. Yeah, <laughs> I had to get special permission from the mayor. People it's a fun should, show. People should see those shows. We'll talk about them as we go. But the cop, the cops one too, and the uh, and the one that Gilbert mangled. Yeah, <laughs> the criminal. Brazos County Jail. Jeff yeah. Ross. That that really narrows it down. The one I mangled. <laughs> also great. 
And and I was in a bunch of these things. You always you're always there for me, Gilbert. You always are. Yeah. Gilbert I, plays Adolf Hitler on my new Netflix show, Historical sure does. Rose. And I called Gilbert. It was a, one of the first calls I made when we were casting the show. And he didn't he agreed before I even got the lure out. <laughs> Gilbert, I need someone to play hit. I'll do it. <laughs> then he comes. He comes in, and I said to the costumer Roger Forker, I said, Gilbert, Godfrey is Hitler, about the same size as Hitler, but I don't want him to be a, a glorious Hitler. I want to see him in the socks, in the later, <laughs> later hosen. The later hosen. I want it to be Gilbert's Hitler. Uh. Gilbert's Hitler. Gilbert has yeah. great legs and a yeah. great walk. So I thought <laughs> we got to show off. Gilbert has beautiful ankles. Yeah, it's like like Brando Stanley Kowalski. Yeah, you, you just you don't want just any any Hitler. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he's played the part before. Yeah, I was Is that in, right. Yeah, 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 I was in a movie where I did a small part as Hitler, but Highway was, to Hell. Yeah, yeah, and that in in Highway to Hell, it was funnier in the credits than it was in the movie. No. This time it was funny. This, we, this time you, to use the, uh, uh, maybe a poor word, murdered. It was such a good, yeah. <laughs> you really, and Gilbert came to rehearsal. He got there before the before the uh, camera people. He was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing the lighting's guy and the costumer, they put the armband and the mustache uh -huh. on Gilbert to make sure everything fit for the, and that was it. Gilbert didn't take it off until he left on the airplane. <laughs> Did he make a beeline to craft services? When he, he, first he did got everything there? as Hitler. He rehearsed <laughs> yes, as Hitler. He, yes. It was wonderful. He really got into character. And <laughs> and I think if Hitler saw it, I think he'd probably be really proud. <laughs> you and Bruno Gans are yeah, the are the oh, definitive yes, Hitlers. Yes. Yeah. And and uh yeah, it was the roast of Anne Frank. How did you feel when you you, you were looking like Hitler? What did it make you feel like? Oh, uh, I finally in my element. <laughs> As a Jewish person, did you have any sort of mixed feelings about doing the role? None. 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 That's the way I operate. Mel Brooks used to talk about revenge through ridicule. This is how the Jews take on the Nazis. Yeah. We mock them. Oh, and he did a lot of it. He did a lot of it. Yeah. I'm Hitler proud of on the, ice. I'm proud of the work we did. I think it came out great. Yeah, I I did too. I think you should win an em a German Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> and let, let's give a nod to John Lovitz as as FDR. Yes, sir. <laughs> Wonderful. And Fred Willard played and God. Fred and Willard. Rachel Feinstein, of course, played Anne Frank. Yep. And I played myself as a Jewish comic during the Nazi occupation. Yes, you were wearing one of those old suits with the Star of David on it. Right. And it made me, it made me, uh, it gave me a certain seriousness. I didn't, I wasn't silly about it. I didn't have to, you know, I, it made me feel like comedy is important. And mm -hmm. what we say is important as comedians. I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to be cavalier about wearing that Jewish star of David. I wanted it to mean something. And I'm not even a religious person, but, you know, and this is, this is our world, Gilbert. This is our our arena. We don't make films. We make sure. roasts. And and there's no very few documentaries or movies about Anne Frank anywhere. I couldn't find any even there's a, there's, to, show, to show my writers for research. There's the diary of Anne Frank. You only have Winters. the diary of Anne Frank. Yeah. yeah. And and as a resource. So and it gave me great pride to see my my writers who were young, my my Vietnamese writer taking home a copy of the diary of Van Frank and coming back the next day with a million ideas and jazzed about it and completely um, all in on her story. So we talk about the Holocaust. We say, never forget. How can we, we got to know about it. The younger right. generation has to know about it for us to really, for the story to go on, for and, the cautionary tale. And one of your writers thanked me a bunch of times during the show but playing Hitler on mm -hmm. it. And the reason was that his grandmother was a camp survivor. Right. Oh, interesting. And he thought this was so important. Right. Like to make a fool out of Hitler. Right. 
and that she survived and, you know, Hitler's being laughed at. Is That's Eddie Firth, who was one of the uh, originators of the historical roast. And uh, his grandmother, Molly, I believe her name is, wrote a book. And um, she survived. And, and he, he his family is very... Proud of the work, proud, proud that he his show took on this thing, and and I think it's if you you can say who could why would you roast Anne Frank? Well, how could you not? Yeah, what am I going to roast someone something I don't care about? This is perhaps one of the mo- people I care about the most in the world. Her book changed the way I think about humanity, and and the, that writer kept thanking me throughout yeah. the whole production. Yes. Yeah. It was so important for him. Yeah. Also, I want to mention the uh, the Lincoln roast with our friend Bob Saget. Oh, yeah. And Stamos as John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> really fun. And who was the comic who was playing Harriet Tubman? She was great. That's Yamanika Saunders. She's hilarious. She's one of our writers and a dear friend of mine. Really funny. Yamanika really attacked that Harriet Tubman role. <laughs> she was wonderful. <laughs> was great. She was great. I hung out with her on Memorial Day. She took me and a bunch of us. Uh, on a on a excursion to the uh, to the Staten Island ferry, she likes to ride the ferry on national holidays. It's free, it's fun, it's patriotic to go past the Statue of Liberty. So Yamanika definitely led us around Staten Island, uh, the Hudson River, the way Harriet Tubman led those people out of slavery. <laughs> Great job by everybody. And and one thing I'm proud of, and I think you are too, you're already. Getting in trouble for these roasts. <laughs> <laughs> I might have seen something about that online. Well, I mean, anytime you take on things that are sacred, you know, if it doesn't offend somebody somewhere, it's not funny. It's probably not funny. So, you, you know, you have to po- It's. I feel it's my responsibility. If you're uncomfortable watching a roast of Anne Frank or Martin Luther King Jr., which we do... Uh, um, follow that discomfort. Maybe you'll learn something about yourself. Maybe you'll learn something about other people. What's wrong with being uncomfortable? What was Carlin's line that you like to talk about, Gilbert? Oh, the jo- the jo- job? George Carlin said it's the duty of a comedian to find out where the line is drawn and deliberately cross over it. Right. Comics without borders. Yeah. I what like is, that. What does your T-shirt say right now uh, when you're wearing, wearing a T-shirt? I'm offended by people who are always offended. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I and in the internet on my age, website. everyone's offended in the internet age because everybody has a bully pulpit now. We yeah. talk about it. In the old days, you had to write a letter. People are trying to get mad. They want to be offended because they know that they have a better punch down at you. Absolutely. They're waiting for you to say anything where they can have the one in the chamber set to go to fire back. It also gives them access to the conversation, to what's going on. Right. And, and, and if you don't answer these these ideas, by the way, people who are might be complaining that the Holocaust should not be mocked, they're probably right. I agree with them. Yeah, this is not the perfect way to learn about this. But I'm the only one talking about Anne Frank. <laughs> That's all I got. That's all I got. I'm sorry. I'm not on the evening news. Like this is my my thing. Some would say these are. There are survivors out there, and these things are a trigger to them. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how many 90-year-olds are watching our Netflix historical roasts, but, I mean, does that mean any talk is a trigger? We we laugh through the pain. If we don't laugh, we cry. It's been a long time since the Holocaust. This is how we're going to learn. I can't expect my teenage nephews to, to go to the Anne Frank house in, in, in Amsterdam to, to learn about the holiday. Not everybody could afford that. You know, I'm, I'm talking to teenagers who are all over the country, all over the world, you know, with this show. Mm-hmm. So there, this is a way to at least get them curious enough to Google Anne Frank or Martin Luther King or Muhammad Ali or some of the other people we talk about. Um, You know, we talk about Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman in this show. Uh, These are names that adults are getting confused about who's who. It it was strangely educational. Right. I realized as I was watching it. So, 
you know, to me, there's so much fake news. We talk about fake news. That's going to evolve into fake history. I felt an obligation to give a people's history. To every joke in the historical roast show, there's six episodes. Every joke is based in fact. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, a trusty narrator. And what what's funny, too, is like... Um it it's it is respectful there's something like it's both extremely offensive and extremely respectful at the same time right well that's what roasts are yeah it's be a great device to be you know it's like a pat on the back and a kick in the ass you know yeah. what i mean speaking of laughter through pain uh, we were talking before we turned the mics on about the prison special uh -huh. that you did, which I watched with my wife, which is f absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Particularly the part where you were uh, performing for the women, right? the incarcerated women, right? and how you bonded with these people. Well, this was a show I did a couple years ago, and I had been trying for a long time to get access to uh, maximum security jail or prison and everybody said no but there's, there's there's a jail in texas brazos county jail where the sheriff and the jail administrators they have a lot of autonomy over their jails and they saw the good in bringing in an entertainer and i and they asked for a month notice so that they could use it as good behavior in other words you had to behave yeah. in order to see my show and when word got out in the jail that I was doing a show for the guys, the women, obviously, they wanted the same incentive. They wanted to say they had a show. And this wasn't part of the plan. I was always up for it, but there were security issues with with how to make that work. Of and, course. And to put all the women in one room at the same time is, is not their normal uh, routine. So... I did an off the cuff, you know, I was looking at all the solitary confinement cells and doing sort of the documentary part of the special and the jail administrator at the time, Wayne Dickey said, the women seem to be really super jealous that you're doing a show for the guys. How do you feel about doing a show for the women in half an hour? <laughs> I go, oh, okay. Okay. Well, I, I worked months on my act for the guys. You pulled it off. So I went into the women's jail and, you know, you can see this if you watch the special. Um, and I did it like a nightclub performance. It wasn't social commentary. It was barely a roast until um, I said stuff like, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, if they were all upset about all wearing the same outfit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like some easy jokes. But um, well, there was the pregnant woman, the pregnant woman in the, in the front, front row, and Big Mama Joe, Big Mama Joe, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were a lot but they of were characters. Into it. They were really into it. So it became an easy, almost like a nightclub show. And I brought women up and roasted them one at a time, and you know some heartbreaking stories. And they all had a pretty good sense of humor. Um, and then afterwards, Wayne told me that the women were buzzing for weeks afterwards because no one had talked to them as women in a long time. Um, it was a humanizing experience and a normalizing experience mm -hmm. for the ladies in the jail. So yeah, it was a cool. It was a, that was a cool uh, way to bring roasting uh, into uh, the incarceration world, which is something that I'm always really curious about. I love that they put the murderers up front oh, yeah. <laughs> in the front row. That was a security. Uh, yeah, that was a security thing. Where are my murderers at? Was your opening line. Yeah, I asked yeah. them where the where the really dangerous people were. They said they'd be up front. Wayne said they'd be up front because, um, because it was easier to get them out if something happened. And uh, I said my opening joke. I said where my murder is at, and three guys in the front raised their hands. And I remember one time you came over to my house because uh, I was a guest on your podcast, right? And and you brought my to my two kids on. And while they were on with you, they were saying, oh, you know, you're not funny. Daddy's funnier than you. <laughs> right. And I remember your reaction. Which you, was? You got a big smile on your face and said, you're roasting me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
it's the my podcast is called Thick Skin with Jeff Ross, and it's about that. It's about taking a joke. You got to have thick skin, especially me. If I dish it out, sure, I'm required to take it. I mean, otherwise, I'm a hypocrite, and I am sensitive the way we all are. And it also, additionally, delighted me to see your son understand as a boy, an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old, what roasting is. Because <laughs> now I go, hey, Gilbert, you know, like, this shit was corny when I was a kid. Now it's cool. Right. <laughs> like, we didn't, I didn't, I didn't know from that stuff as a kid. It was like, it was funny to see some of the old-time comics on Johnny Carson and stuff like that. Of course, that was a big influence to me, obviously. Love uh, that type of humor, but... um when I first started doing the roasts, um, they were antiquated. Yeah, they were. It was like saying I, I joust or I know Latin. It was yeah. a lost art, and uh, you know, through through a lot of hard work and love, like roasts are more popular than they've ever been. And not only that, like boys and girls will roast a bully. You know, I, that makes me so happy. I always saw roasting as a form of self defense. You know, I studied karate as a sure. kid. When I was your son Max's age, I was already probably a brown belt in Taekwondo. So I understood the power of um, of being quiet. I understood that, you know, you, you could let a bully mouth off. And then at a certain point, you could shut it down too, either with your words or with a good solid front snap kick was the kid you talk about in the book the one that would hide around corners and and, and oh yeah punch you in the crotch oh yeah was he a, was he a catalyst yeah for you know if you get picked on you you either break or you know it's like fight or flight right mm -hmm. and you can only fly so many times till you have to fight back if you're going to exist in an environment and i don't know i think roasting is sort of like that i only roast volunteers and i only roast bullies and the ones I love, you know, if they're not going to be there, you know, I, don't, I rarely talk behind people's back. I like to talk people to their face. Do your kids know what a roast is, Gilbert? By, they, by, by name? I mean, you've never, obviously you and Dara have not exposed them to the Comedy Central roasts. Yeah, yet. but they, they kind of, they seem to just have a gut reaction like they were doing with Jeff. They understand it. You know, they somehow. were like insulting him and, and Jeff was was real happy about it. Oh, I felt like I, I broke through. Yeah, it, so, it influenced them. They kept insulting Jeff, and it was, like, perfect. And now and now they'll, they'll uh, you know, that type of humor lives on, and that makes us not forgotten. It makes us, it gives us a legacy, Gilbert. That type of humor, the roast humor, you know, roast battling, you know, that these roast battles that I do, they... They're all over the world now. They're in everywhere from Russia to, to Asia. They're in India. We have a roast battle on Mexican television, British television, Australian television, French Canadian television. We do these roast battles. So roasting itself is like a new pillar of comedy. The way when improv got big, I think roasting is in a way it's unlimited. If it's presented well, there's an, there's a an ocean of appetite for it. There are great ones at the at the friars that we've all attended. You got you've been on them. Gilbert's been on yeah. them. The ones that were never televised. Right. The Matt Lauer one. Right. Comes to mind. I mean, really great stuff. The Jerry Lewis one. Yeah. Really great stuff that nobody will ever it's great see. That you were at all these roasts. I was. Friends. I was on the writing staff. You're a real a witness to my career. <laughs> my early Friars Club well, career. Bill Sheft and Leopold and Amorost and I were writing on some of them. And and a lot of those things, I mean, they're in house for the friars. But other than unless you were in that room, right at the Hilton, you'll never see those. Yeah, right? a, a lot of them were as good as the Comedy and Central was. I, I remember they wrote a whole article about the Matt Lauer roast, uh -huh. and they oh, yeah. they singled me out and said among uh, the horrible, you know, offensive roasties was Gilbert Gottfried saying. Uh, offensive racist jokes. Oh, with Ann Curry. About Ann Curry's <laughs> genitalia. Remember it now. <laughs> <laughs> and did you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was doing loads of Asian jokes about Ann Curry's genitalia. <laughs> uh, 
I remember all of those. I miss I, I miss those days. I do love those classic live afternoon. Oh, they Brian's were great. Club yes, roast. they were great. Do you remember the one that you told at the Lewis joke that at the Lewis roast? You know the one I mean. The one where you were told not. What do you mean? To go, it's my best joke ever. Uh, it's not the best joke I've ever had. Yeah, not to go after that particular subject. Um, Can you share it? Of course. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Lewis uh, getting roasted. He's probably you know eighty. That point, yeah. And you know, I didn't know him very well, but he was obviously you know somebody I admired. He was a big comedy star. Uh, the Jerry Lewis telethon. Growing up, of course, he raised. Millions and millions and millions of dollars, and I watched it with my parents as a kid, and we saw entertainers raising money, doing good. It was a mitzvah, something I could understand, you know, a connection to show business. Um, and they said, "Well, you're doing a Friars Club roast. Jerry's excited. He's the new abbot of the Friars Club. This is a big thing. You know, this isn't like somebody you're going to see once. This is somebody you're going to have to get to know. He's the new head of the Friars, and and." I really wanted to impress them, obviously, but they said, you know, one caveat, not a big deal. We know you would never do this, but he's very touchy about any jokes about Jerry's kids, <laughs> the disabled kids from the muscular dystrophy telethon. And of course, I say, of course, I would never do that. And now immediately in my head, immediately in my head, it's all I could think about. You know, I, I got to, how do I take it to the line? Uh, how do I, how do I, how do I, make the hair stand up on the back of his neck, but not piss him off. Mm -hmm. How do I let him know that I'm great <laughs> and I should not be fucked with, even though I'm some punk kid. I wanted, I wanted to make him laugh, but I also wanted to let him know I was roasting him and that it was, that, that it was, I was, I was good at it. And, 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 and I would earn his respect that way. And I talked about it a lot. Like, had a lot of great jokes about Jerry Lewis that sort of warmed him up. I said, you know, he he was really big in France. Then again, the French don't even know when they stink. A great one. <laughs> there was also the Nathan Lane joke. Which one was that? But Nathan and Jerry, he was on the dais. Yeah. You said Nathan and Jerry have a lot in common. They both started sucking in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Jerry Lewis is sitting there. He's flanked by Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro. Yeah. Jerry's having a time of his life. It's all about him. A couple thousand people to New York Hilton. And I go on kind of late and they say something to the effect of, you know, Jerry, they all been making fun of you, but what about the great things that you do? Uh, not enough has been said about the great things that you do in your life. Like just last Labor Day, a six-year-old kid got up out of his wheelchair and walked for the first time to turn off the Jerry Lewis telescope. <laughs> As funny as it was then. <laughs> and you just saw Jerry's shoulders tensing up as I milked it. And then when I got to the punchline, I have a picture. I'll have to repost it when this podcast comes out of just Jerry just losing it. And De Niro covering his face laughing. And Scorsese squirming <laughs> so in his good. seat. Uh, and, you know, Jerry and I became friendly after that. That was also the infamous roast with the uh, later Aretha Franklin. Oh, is moment, that the same moment. night? Moment. Yes, same oh. same night. She was fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah I said, uh, I said, um, well, she sang the national anthem. She to, sang. She, I don't even think she sang the. I think she sang um, America the. Oh Beautiful. yes, you're right. You're right. And I went up and I said, I never been to a show where the fat lady sings in the beginning. <laughs> 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 and uh, <laughs> she flipped you the bird. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember the <laughs> best thing Jerry Lewis ever said to me that it was yeah. I was I one thing honoring him or whatever and I did some really offensive long joke and he went up to me and it looked like he was offended at first and he said, Gilbert, you're out of your fucking mind. And then he takes a pause and goes, And I wouldn't want you any other way. <laughs> and I thought that's it. That's a true you got comic. Him. Yeah. You got him. I earned his respect, you know, earlier than that, but he didn't remember. It was, uh, he came to the Improv Comedy Club in West Hollywood and he looked at comics, basically auditioned people to be on the telethon. He wanted to break some younger comics and he really liked me and I got to do the telethon a couple times. 
in the late 90s. I'd always wear the same tuxedo, but put a different shirt on each year. So that <laughs> I had no money. It was a free gig. Now, what I loved about Gilbert at those Friars roasts is how <laughs> the, the, the writers would write for everybody else, and everybody else would prepare material. And Gilbert was so lazy that he would just yeah. get up and say, fuck it, I'm doing my dirty joke CD. Yeah. <laughs> That's nothing what, to do with the roasty. I, that's what Hedda Youngman would do. <laughs> yes. Nothing to do with the, that's the, the great, guest of honor. I think that's a wonderful tactic to just be able to go up whenever you want and not have to worry about preparing. Yeah, it's like, yeah, Henny Youngman used to go up those things and say, you know, I'm very happy to be here at the Georgie Jessel Roast. A rabbi walks into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Gilbert, who was your favorite comedian growing up? Oh, God, there were so many. They were like, and I like those old guys who are all still around. Uh-huh. Did you, you like, like insult comics like that? Were you into the well, dirty? Well, I did, I did love Don Rickles. Yeah. And and Henny Youngman I loved. You mean obscure old guys, too, like Leonard Barr and, and oh, those, yeah. those kind of guys? And Leonard, it, Leonard Cohen, Myron Cohen? They, oh, Myron Cohen was yeah. terrific. Yeah. And there were so many, like... Uh, you know, you could see both the old guys. You like guys. Jackie Vernon, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you could see both the old guys and what were considered the young guys who are now in their 90s. <laughs> <laughs> I miss, I, miss I, I feel like I I miss not, not getting to see uh, Jackie Vernon, oh. Fat Jackie Leonard. Yeah, sure. Young Don Rickles. I would have loved all, all those guys. Stuff. Well, how about some of the guys that used to kill at those Friars Rose at the Hilton that people may not know about, like Dick Capri. Oh, yeah. Who was always hilarious. Yes. Still, always brought still. it. Freddie, too, and Stewie. Of course. You know. I mean, that's where I, I saw it all go down, you know. Back then, you, I, when I first got asked to do the roast, you couldn't, I couldn't Google it. I had to go to the Museum of Broadcasting and look up what these roasts were. I had no idea. So you see once that you don't have to just make fun of the guests of honor. You can make fun of the other comics there i was so excited because then i got to riff with buddy hackett and milton burrow and all these guys and you made danny aiello cry we made I danny aiello <laughs> cry. Oh, tell us this one. <laughs> oh, you don't know this story i'm sure i do it sounds very familiar I think joy was the roast mistress on that i think roast. she was she hosted that yeah, joy she Behar. Did. yes oh it was just you know danny aiello who i adore great guy phenomenal actor it was a big moment he had a new cbs show that just Do Dolivantura. 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 He was playing some sort of New York detective. Yeah. And uh, it was on every bus, every billboard in New York. And uh, we had a roast for him. You know, he's a friar. And it made sense. And all his friends and family were there. <clears throat> and I said something like, you know, Danny Aiello's acting is so over the top that show should be called Ace Dolivantura. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, the show had just come out. None of us had seen it. So we were just kind of joking that it was bad. But then the bells went up. Oh. Richard Belzer went up with the actual New York Post and Daily News reviews. Yeah, ripped them. That, that Danny obviously had not read that morning. <laughs> it was a great day. <laughs> oh, we were at the geez. roast. It was only lunchtime. Oh, fuck. And, you know, uh, and, and, and Bells just verbatim read the reviews. And Danny's hearing them for the first time. Oh, man. And, and that, was, that was it. That was it. Then Danny made his speech and something hit him. He got very emotional. He says it was, he was thinking about his dad and how his dad was missing this amazing day. But I really think it was the reviews. <laughs> I used to hide in the back of the room and scroll those jokes down on a piece of paper, even though I wasn't supposed to, because I, I knew that I would not see the tape and I would forget them. Right. And, and like, uh, we've talked about it on this show. Bells are, say, bells are talking about Freddie Roman. Oh, yeah. And that wonderful line. Remember it? Jack Ruby had a longer TV career. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to, when you were up there and I used to scroll on a little piece of paper and I'd, I hope nobody would see me, but I said, these are going to get lost if I don't, Write them down and, and, and remember them. They were that good. It's funny. I mean, I remember watching the roasts when I was a kid. Uh -huh. And those were always very homogenized. And then you'd hear about the these guys, these old guys like Jack Benny and stuff, at the actual Friars roast. Oh, yeah. And how just foul 
and offensive they were. Right. And that was the appeal, right? You got to see Milton Berle say, say the C word and the F word yeah. and all this kind of stuff where you would never see that on Texaco Star Theater. Oh, and the NBC roasts were in part to promote NBC shows and NBC yes. talent. So that's why you had Red Fox and LaWanda Page. And, yeah. and all of these people would come in. They were they were network friendly. And it was always funny when you they'd be roasting Orson Welles and like Gary Coleman would roast him. <laughs> and you go, what is yeah. the connection? Yeah. Did you ever have did you ever have some of the old comics give you a hard time for working blue? Yes. Yes. That happens, right? Yeah. And and it's so funny, and I've talked about it here because there have been comics who I've spoken to off stage who'll tell me the most foul joke in the world. And then I'll say, Hey, can you repeat some of those jokes? And they'll act like they, they don't know what you're talking about. Marty Allen did that to us yes. on this show. Really? He told us the filthiest, most wonderful jokes. And then Gilbert tried to get him to do it on mic and he wouldn't bite. Yeah. Here he is. He's like a hundred, <laughs> but he's protecting his image. Well, he was still performing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That is crazy. Let's talk about another thing you guys have been doing together or not not too long ago. Gilbert guested on a show on right. Comedy Central. The hilarious Bumping Mics. Bumping Mics on Netflix. Yeah. That was oh, a it's lot on Netflix. of fun Forgive me. to do. Yeah. Um, Gilbert, Bill, Gilbert introduced us, David Tell and I, go on stage together and we do a two-man act. I don't even know if it's an act. It's... It's a show, it's a hangout, it's a party, and we invite our friends. And I asked Gilbert to come by, and next thing I know, I show up at the venue, and Gilbert's already on stage introducing us. <laughs> <laughs> nice work, Gilbert. <laughs> if you like scissoring vagina, I saw that, yeah. <laughs> the funniest comedy team since Ike and Tina Turner. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then Gilbert stayed for the whole show and uh and uh it was just a treat because um as much as I love Gilbert, David Tell is obsessed with Gilbert. It would be great if we had asked David Tell to come. Yeah. Bumping mics was so much fun. We're yeah. gonna be in yeah. Vegas June seventh and eighth. You we're and gonna, Dave. We're gonna be at um Harris SoCal the week after that. Okay. We're gonna be at the Morongo Casino in a couple of weeks. So this is the most fun I've ever had on stage. All roasts aside, when Dave is around, it's Hello. like one plus you guys one. Are oh. together. I, uh oh, what I, happened? Somebody I, just came because in. Because he really. I, I think I'm we right have here. a guest. He really is my favorite comedian. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi, Dave. Look at that. Dave Attell is here, ladies and uh, gentlemen. How did he happen to find the place? Nice. <laughs> bump it out. Well, bump it up. First bump of the, of the podcast. Dave sleeps under the table. <laughs> Dave, get close to that mic, would you? Thanks, buddy. Wow. Great to see you, partner. Yeah, no, I was outside. I was now it was a while before I came in here. Were you guys reading the Mueller report? Yeah. What were you guys doing? <laughs> a lot of nodding and uh-huhs and you're right. Yeah. But we should wait and see and I don't knows and <laughs> Yeah. We were, it was so serious in here. Talking about bumping mics. Yes. And I was talking before about your wonderful line about Gilbert. Oh, which one was that? You, you said, uh, Gilbert, have you ever gone down on a on a live woman? <laughs> not, not one from your, from your collection? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're taking poetic uh, license with that one. <laughs> but um, Gilbert, and I think Jeff will back me up on this. When Jeff and I are together, it's good. When Gilbert was there, went to another level. Gilbert completed us, I think, um, <laughs> in terms of... In terms of Romantic. what bumping mics could be, he really did. He's the third, like at the triad, he is the third spoke, and he really is that good. You're like when jo when Joe Walsh joined the Eagles. Wow, Gilbert, the Whoa, band had, had a little more kick to it. Yep, it really, it really kicked took it into rock and roll from oh, country and western rock. Thank yeah. you. None of that JD Souther shit. Yeah. So anyway, we want to make you a partner, Gilbert. Yes. <laughs> We're going to pay you in merch. We yes. Just start, <laughs> we just started uh, selling merch on the road, everyone. It's a whole new uh, experience for us. Oh, that's a so, page yeah. out of so his I'll book. So I'll get a bumping mics uh, pin or something. Sure, Gilbert, if not? you were going to yeah. bump mics with a, your own partner, who would it be? Oh, that's good. Oh. Right. Shecky? 
Yeah. <laughs> have to be Shaq. I, I have to say, uh, Tim Conway, <laughs> when I heard about that, yes. I was like, that is the set. I wonder if Gilbert ever had him on the show. Did you ever have him we on tried, the show? We tried. We tried. He okay. wasn't in good health. Hmm. We tried. Yeah. So how about you and Tim Conway? Do you think you can, <laughs> think you can keep up with him? He is a master. <laughs> Gilbert, did you walk in here wearing Bumping Mike's merch? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, okay. I was wearing a cap. So it's already out. <laughs> it's yes. already available. It's a, it's available on Netflix. And this, three episodes. this is true. Dave made 30 hats. Yeah. Gave, no, I, gave one to Gilbert. I, uh, I, I will say this, that um, since we, Jeff and I are really... Uh, we're into meeting the fans. We know there's a lot of comedy fans who come to the show, both the live performance and when we taped. And that, um, you know, at the end of the show now, when we stand out there and we're hawking the merch, it's another experience because it's great to see these people. They don't only like us. They like a lot of comics. And that's really what I think is a comedy fan. Like when they have like a basically like a top 10 or like, you know, you, you know who I wish I could see. And, you know, I heard the uh, podcast about Mitch Hedberg or other like guys who are no longer with us. And I was like, that's cool. You know, and I love that that's our fan base. And and it's always great when someone will say to you, uh, you know, my favorite comics are you and they will name like two or three others. And you go, wow, those are great comics. Yeah. You put me in a category with. That is, sometimes it's the only two they can think of. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch Gilbert, Hedberg, you, funny guy. you are my favorite captain with comic with Charlie Chaplin and Jim Carrey. <laughs> <laughs> it is a real love boat of laughter. <laughs> Jeff and I were in Atlantic City, and I was trying to get you. I was telling Darrett, like, we got to get you to come down to this gig. But you were on the road as well in Canada, I believe. Yeah. For Memorial Day. Which is awesome, I guess. I don't know why. You have like a different road than we do, or what do you do? You're I, on the road a lot. I don't know. It's like they say, we'll pay you here, and I go. You just go. Yeah. Because I didn't know Megabus went to Canada. <laughs> I always assume from that doc, Jeff, did you see the documentary of He's Gilbert? in it. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, he uh, is getting on a Megabus, and it was like one of the saddest, <laughs> most truest <laughs> things about comedy. He's got a way too big a bag. For the amount of time he's going to be on the road, like you're going to be on two days, maybe three days, he's got like this gigantic bag, like you're like you're an au pair and you're moving into someone's brownstone for the summer. <laughs> it was so big and sad. <laughs> I think Bill Burr says in the doc, "What the fuck is he doing on the bus? <laughs> Don't people recognize yeah, him? Don't people exactly. say, hey, is that Gilbert Gottfried?'" <laughs> Your yeah. tour bus is yeah. a Greyhound. Yeah, he, he yeah. also says... Just like the, John Madden. He also says in the documentary, he goes, that there's people that are going, gee, I want to use the bathroom, <laughs> but Gilbert Gottfried's in there. <laughs> <laughs> How did Bumping Mice come together as a concept? Was it accidental? That's a good question, Jeff. Has a it was not accidental as much as uh, improvised. It was just an improvised, fun way to get our yayas out late at night. Mm -hmm. Dave would have a spot, or I would have a spot. More often than not, I'd go right from the airport. I'd land back home in New York, run by the comedy cellar because I was hungry or lonely. I'd go watch Dave, and and Dave would just bring me up, and we just started like sort of bumping it out. I would have a new joke to try out every once in a while. Dave would always have a new joke to try out, and next thing we knew, I was begging him to come up to Montreal. Actually, we did a couple tour dates. We did a stop in Vegas. Yeah, I wanted to go on the road. But, Jeff, it's really like the whole, I guess you could say, the reason why I went to TV would be because of Jeff. Because Jeff took what was just like kind of a fun, like, blow-off thing that we would do. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, this is definitely a show, and I believe in it. So it's really uh, everything from the branding, the naming of the show, to, like, bringing it to Netflix is all Jeff. I'm, I'm just the other guy who was there when it comes to all that stuff. Because I really do think that, like, you know... Uh, we were lucky to capture the kind of the, the fun of like anything could happen because really that was like what was so good about the seller experience is that it's late. People have already seen about eight acts and I always go on late for years there. Like I just go on late and it used to be because I was, you know, like kind of the worst guy there and they would throw you on at the end. Now it's more about like, you know, I got a lot of errands to run and then I need a nap. <laughs> then I'm going to go down. You know, I'm old. I'm the old guy. And Dave's and, been moving all week, yeah, so year, I can't get him years on the now. Moving. I've been moving years, and the and the and the best part is that you know they're always cool with like letting us do whatever we want, and I think that the charm of that place is that. 
you never know who's going to drop by. And you also never know what's going to happen. And whether it's a conversation on stage or like just working with the audience that it's kind of built for that. It's a small, tiny room. And Gilbert is another good example of like, you know, I don't know if you know this, but like his fearlessness is, is really what like I love about his thing on the bumping mics is that like, you know, Jeff doesn't have a filter. You don't have a filter. So it's really great to see you guys really open up on these young crowds, yeah. especially like it kind of must blow them away, you know? Yeah, I'm sure. I Anything like can happen at our shows, even June 6th and 7th at the Mirage. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely what hoping, done. What we're hoping to happen would be some uh, sold out shows. That would be great. Anything can happen at our shows, especially when they're at the Morongo on June 14th <laughs> or Harris Hotel on June 15th. The Morongo. That sounds like a great, like, uh, you know, then there was the Morongo. <laughs> Like we're we're on go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say anything can happen October 4th and 5th at the Paramount Theater in Huntington. <laughs> yes. That's oh, Long that's Island. A great, that's a great that's venue. That's my hometown. That's a great venue. We <laughs> played Jersey. That's Jeff's That's Jeff's hood. But we're going to play Long Island. Gilbert, you should come to that show. I'm okay. throwing it out right now. You should open for us in Huntington. What do you think? All right. You don't mind like, taking a pay cut yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and an Uber to get there? Megabus. And, oh, and we were speaking about merchandise before, yeah. and I remember when you came and did the podcast at my house, you gave me a bunch of hats and T-shirts. Right. And then you bought a bunch of T-shirts yes. from me. <laughs> Great. Yeah, well, it was Christmas time. Gilbert had just oh done God. Dave and I this gigantic favor, so I brought over... Um, oh, sweet. A bunch of uh, bumping mics, uh, you know, stuff, and and I went on my I went on Gilbert's website and bought thirty <laughs> T-shirts for my friends. Very uh, nice, very sweet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, do, do people both, cherish those T-shirts. This is the one with his my face cousin on Aaron them? uses his to wash his car. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel, gave, I gave him one. He uses it to. Uh, I don't know. This is the new shirt oven. with Gilbert's face on it. Yeah, the recent one. Do you guys remember seeing Gilbert for the first time? That's Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Up close, yes. I do. yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. That must have been like five haircuts ago. <laughs> I think it was. It was more of a. Uh, <laughs> Gil, do you yeah. still walk to Chinatown to get the five dollar haircut? Oh yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Now I get it. <laughs> Just check. Yeah, it. yeah. You gave me a segue. Yeah, I heard that your Chinese name is you again. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. In these times with the tariffs and all, it's the best we can do with these tariffs. <laughs> we call them no tip off the top. <laughs> you you guys revealed on bumping mics where you first met the two yeah. of you, but do you really remember seeing him for the first time? It had to be the improv, right? I I don't I don't even remember. Like catch? when I was allowed to talk to Gilbert because he was a legend when I started uh -huh. and I never really saw him at the clubs, maybe a catch a rising star. I saw you do a couple of spots or something like that, but I never like every night you had already moved on to that. You were a TV guy, you were a film guy and uh, you did all that voiceover stuff. So I think your club work in New York, you were too busy doing other stuff, right? So when I would see him, it was a huge like deal. Like, Oh, that's Gilbert. Gilbert's there. And then I was I was so into it, but uh, it had to be in the '90s, I assume. Do you remember? You have yeah. any memory of this? Oh, of meeting these two guys? No, I try to block it. Out <laughs> <of my head. laughs> I feel like Gilbert and I became better and better friends as we as the years went on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As both like, of our careers tanked. Yeah. We all, <laughs> like a, <laughs> that's I remember fun Gilbert. dinners. I remember fun dinners with you and Saget and Norm McDonald. Oh, those were hysterical. I remember bringing John Stamos to see uh, you at Caroline's on Broadway. John Stamos is a friend, and he was on Broadway in, uh, I think it was Chicago. He was starring in the play Chicago. And I brought my brother in law and John Stamos to Caroline's. We're watching Gilbert and. This is about six, seven years ago, and Gilbert is up there doing Callista Flockhart is so skinny jokes. <laughs> and yeah. Stamos they still hold up. And Stamos is is needling me, going, "Hey, he's great, but you know, he, he I saw him do these jokes fifteen years ago. The same right. joke." And I go, "Dude, you're in Chicago. That plays like fifty years old." <laughs> <Good point. laughs> I go, it's a classic joke. Close to Flockhart, still skinny. He, he's still doing Norman Fell material yeah, right. from 78, from when I saw him at the old Carolines. Dave, uh, yeah? Jeff raised an interesting question. He was asking Gilbert what comics 
he admired. Who, Gilbert? Starting out. Same question for you, because I'm curious. Mm. Were you one of these guys like Jeff that would sort of stay up to watch Rodney on Carson? Yes. You know, uh, that was one of the first live shows I ever got to see was Rodney Dageville at the Westbury Music uh, Theater. Hey, I'll tell you. In, uh, <laughs> in, the, in the 80s when hey, he kid, was at gotta, his height. Maybe it'll be a big comment someday. <laughs> I didn't get to meet him or anything like that. Hey, I see but, you out there in Road J. <laughs> Was, kids laughing a little too hard. You know, you know how now in the clubs, <laughs> in the clubs, everybody's doing, uh, you know, with the phones and all that recording. But the guy sitting next to me had a pad out, and I go, "What are you doing?" He goes, "I'm writing these down for tomorrow. I'm going to use them at work." <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, how was it? How was your How was your weekend, Jim? You know, my mother-in-law. <laughs> um, <laughs> wait, hold. Well, no, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, my my. Uh, forget it. <laughs> But yeah, it was so funny. Now, you told a story, Jeff, yeah. that you were talking, I guess, at a Friars thing, and you went up to the podium and you were killing. Yeah. And Milton Berle. Oh, was yeah. Sit, and that's, tell that's, us that's what in the was book. going on. Oh, well, my very first roast ever. <laughs> um, Milton Berle was the roast master, and we were roasting Steven Seagal. Oh. And I I didn't really care much about Steven Seagal. I just knew I wanted to be up there with Milton Burrow and Buddy Hackett and Henny Youngman. And I had my one good suit on. It was my first roast. I worked really hard on it. I had pages of shit I had to go through. I wanted to really just... And uh, every time I got a big laugh, my opening joke was, a lot of you don't know me, but I feel uniquely qualified to be here today because I'm also a shitty actor. <laughs> Steven Seagal, you know, looked at me. He's the only one not laughing. And, and right when I got the laugh, Milton Burrow poked me in the ribs. He was sitting right behind me as, as I was at the podium. And I jumped up. And it was kind of odd. And the only person that had ever done that to me, poked me, was my cantor during my haftorah. <laughs> And that was to, like, relax me. And I was like, I don't need to be relaxed. I'm a professional comedian. Why is this old fart, like, touching me while I'm performing in front of 1,500 people at the Hilton in New York? My first Friars row. And he gave me a terrible introduction, too. Like, he just came from a, a convention from Las Vegas where he performed at a convention for lesbians with dildo rash. That's how he brought me up. <laughs> And every time I get a laugh, he hits me. And I, I finally, I start engaging with him and going back and forth. And uh, and uh, I said, I saw Milton. Milton, I saw you downtown today at an antique shop. He's like, oh, yeah? I go, 1200 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and he starts coming after me. And finally, Buddy Hackett was like 30 feet down the... Uh, down the uh, dais, and he he goes, he's off mic, he's just sitting, Look, Milton, let the kid work. Remember when you used to? <laughs> <laughs> and Milton ran down there, and he kissed, he kissed Buddy and the two of them. I said, between the two of them, they have over 30 years of homosexual experience. <laughs> and then Milton came back and, 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 and took over, back back the podium. And uh, I, I loved it. I was like riffing with the great, great ones. And afterwards, uh, I asked Milton, you know, Buddy said, go talk to Milton. We were back at the Friars Club having a drink. And Buddy and I sort of, you know, we palled up right there. I loved him for sticking up for me. And I went and I to talk to Milton. And Milton, I asked him why he was, like, poking at me. And he, and he didn't really answer me directly, but he said, they only remember the home runs. They only remember the home runs. And later I was like, I guess he means I went on too long or something. And Buddy later told me, uh, that it was because he was jealous. He would get jealous and he would just... Interesting. He would be juvenile. He would just annoy people for no reason. And was So he... it's hard to know. Either way, it was good advice. They only remember the home runs. I have a similar story mm. with Stan Laurel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> instead, of, uh, instead of with his finger, um, <laughs> I was getting the business end of his cane, if you know what I mean. <laughs> now... A train was coming at us, so we got off the track, but there was another track, and a train was coming the opposite direction. <laughs> I was out front trying to restart the engine. <laughs> I didn't realize you were that old. <laughs> I'm very old, Jeff. Yeah, Laurel. Yeah, I'll tell you. Great, before we, before great podcast. <laughs> great podcast. Wouldn't that be great if Rodney was alive during all this podcasting? Can you imagine him? Oh, like, God. Hey, we'll how be... long is this going to take? Come on. <laughs> i got to get out of here. <laughs> 
It's supposed to be at the Sands. <laughs> Before we jump off Milty, it's in the book. He did show you. You are one of the select honored few who got to see it. I did see his penis. <laughs> Tell us in detail. <laughs> yeah. This is for you, Gil. We can't move yeah, on. I haven't you thought know. about this in a long time. <laughs> We're at the Friars Club in Beverly Hills. Milton was sort of in his wheelchair stage of his life. Mm. And I had just done a roast for Joe Torre, the Yankees manager. And Milton took a bow. And I said, look, Milton Burrow, he's like 90 years old. And look, he has a wheelchair for his cock. <laughs> so big. So Milton did jump out of his seat and wave, but then he'd go back into the wheelchair and Basically, he was not really performing anymore, and I would I would have lunch with him at the Friars Club like two times a week or so, and uh, I don't think he needed help getting to the bathroom. I think he wanted to show me his cock. <laughs> wow. So he said, like, yeah, walk me to the bathroom. I'm like, oh, here's my big chance. <laughs> you know, because you have to remember, you know, <laughs> his cock was legendary. Yes. Every roast, there were a million jokes about the size of his penis. Right. Right? And when I roasted Joe Torrey, I would say stuff like, Milton Burrow's dick is so big it has a warning track. <laughs> <laughs> he jerks off with pine tar. That's how big his dick is. <laughs> you know, Milton obviously loved the attention, but, you know, it, and I go to the bathroom with him and we're kind of side by side at the urinal and, you know, I know this really sounds like a fruity story, but it really is a show business story. <laughs> you know, he didn't say anything about it at all, but I just couldn't resist, like, <laughs> side-eyeing, like, getting a little sure. glimpse. And I didn't even see the whole thing. <laughs> wow. That's big. I saw I would, what seemed to be, like, 40%, judging by, by where his hand was. <laughs> Like, I, I saw a little less than half of it, and it was humongous. Gilbert's so wow. envious. Ah, it was I huge. have a question. Yeah. So what did it taste like? <laughs> tastes like that reminds me of when I saw Tony Field stump. Now, <laughs> we were backstage at Battle of the Network Store in 72. And <laughs> give me that one. Get it. Tony Stump. <laughs> I saw her stump in all its glory. <laughs> we bump podcast mics. This is so much him. fun. Almost as much fun as the Mirage June 7th. <laughs> Good one, Jeff. Nice work. Dave, did you befriend any older comics? No, Jeff has got like the... Really, Jeff... Uh -huh. No, is he really like we all? I wanted to be Sam Kinison. I wanted to be mm -hmm. Bill Hicks. Right. And Jeff, you know, when he got involved with the Friars, he basically <laughs> re, re revitalized that whole he thing. He did. He did. And and uh, you know, he would tell me like, you know, like when I talked to him, I go, "Where are you?" <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm just gonna whatever. He's like. Uh, Shecky Green's accountant died. I had to get on a plane. He wanted me to do the eulogy. Um, I don't know if you remember. I don't know if you remember. Like, he knows all these great names. I, I, I It's like, I, I wish I knew them, you know? You learn a lot from, from your elders. Absolutely. You know? I agree with that. Yeah. Now, we, Gil, Gilbert, I got to ask you, you probably have met over your, over your career, like, some people that we wouldn't even think of. Like, who was your comic idol? Who was it? Oh, God, let's see. Well, I met Henny Youngman a couple of times. Yes, that was I love Henny Youngman. Meeting Henny. But I haven't, you know, I don't remember that many older comics I've met. Well, Jerry. Yeah, Jerry I yeah. met. That yeah. was, you know, and Hackett. amazing. Hackett. Hackett, yes. yeah. yeah. The yeah. big four. Jerry Hackett, Burl. No. Yeah. Oh, Burl I met a couple of times. He was hysterical. <laughs> When we were on Bert Kreisner's podcast, uh, cooking show with Bert, and Bert's a very funny guy, really cool. He also was super re respectful to the legendary comic. He asked uh, Gilbert, who he worked with in New York in the 70s and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I said that, um, you know, Gilbert knew him all. And uh, he said, did he know Freddie Prince? And I said, of course he did. He handed him a gun and said, <laughs> here's my gun and cocaine. I'll be back in a few minutes. And Bert's like, is that real? And I'm like, come on, dude. <laughs> 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 
we ah. we do talk about those seventies comics. I love when, them. When you started, we've talked yeah. about guys like that. Guys I, like Timmy Rogers. And I, oh yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I remember Gabe Kaplan when I was in my early when I was a teenager at Catch. Gabe Kaplan would go on, and one of his bits was like, you know. There was this group of kids in his school named the Sweat Hogs. Right. Really? And yeah. And there was an annoying sure. kid named Horseshack. So that was his act? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I saw him do yeah. it on Carson. Yeah. That's crazy. That's pretty cool. And of course, in the act, he would say, and then they'd call him Horseshit. And, but wow. he couldn't do that. Yeah. On. Did you meet uh, Johnny Carson? Uh, never. No, no. Never had any connection with Carson. And did you like him more as a host or as a magician? <laughs> no. no one ever talks about his magic. Let's talk about it now. <laughs> Carsoni. Yeah. Carsoni. I liked how people go, you know, he's a frustrated magician. Oh, okay. <laughs> I got to think most magicians are frustrated. Yeah, I figure, you know. Were you guys Steve Martin fans in the day? Also, yeah. also a magician. My favorite. And yeah. I, what I like about Steve Martin is that, like, when you think about crowds and how crowds have changed, is that he had the other end of the kind of crowds we have now, because now everybody's so, you know, sensitive and PC. His crowd, they basically were all high. Yeah. Everybody was high. They were on every kind of drug you can imagine. They were party people, you know, and that's just the crowd he had, and you could hear it on those albums of, like, he can barely set up the joke. Yeah. They're still laughing at the last joke, and they're, like, just yelling at him. Same thing with Carlin and also, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Albert Brooks, like yeah, sure. they had that kind of party crowd. They were more of a rock and roll crowd than today's crowd. That's for sure. Same uh, problem the Beatles had. That Steve oh, Martin yeah. had. So yeah. they did comedy. He had to stop performing because the crowd was too was I too feel like Dave yeah. and I. We don't we, have that problem. I feel like <laughs> we do not have that. You can hear a pin drop. I'm not lying to you, Frank. <laughs> I feel like that gig we did last week. I felt like we had like a rock. Be crowd. Yeah, Bethlehem, PA. That's our that's really? our hood. Yeah, that's our room. I felt like we had a rock show vibe going. That's not Amish country. I just we no, just looked at the uh, artwork and and liner notes and stuff for the Bumping Mike's vinyl album that's coming out. <clears throat> and when I was holding it, I did feel like I was in a band in a way. Like you know how when you're a kid, you're like, hey, if I ever have an album, like this is gonna be like Bumping Mike's to me feels like I'm in some kind of band. There's nothing better on vinyl record than crowd work. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you get to use your imagination. I remember listening to Hello Dummy, which is Don Rickles' thing. And oh, it's like, sure. He's talking to people in the crowd. I'm like, I wonder what suit that guy's wearing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Who is that guy? He must be Does Japanese. Like my dad? <laughs> Based on the jokes, he must be Asian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who would always be in the third row. You know, yes. it's like, oh, and the Asian guy in the third row. Right. It's like. Tell, tell us a little bit about Rickles since we segued in. There. I love him. Oh, yeah. And you well, you wrote been, a nice tribute to him in Rolling Stone. Yeah, I did. I cared about Don because, you know, he made it okay to not just be self-deprecating, but all deprecating. He yeah. would make fun of stuff. He, would, he, he, he wasn't afraid to speak truth to powerful people. And I love that, you know. And his daughter, Mindy Rickles, is on Gilbert's. Oh, yeah episode nice. of the historical row she actually plays don rickles really and and i admired don i can't say we were close buddies but i certainly uh considered him a, a friend and he has he's the master at that you know so and you know a lot of his stuff when you when you think about it like how do you develop an act like that and that's like a lot of lounge late night lounge you know Drunks, working with drunks, working with hecklers. That's how he started doing that, really, yeah. that kind of act. Vegas, old Vegas, not the Disney Vegas, the old Vegas. Like, you could just see it in him, like, the uh, the fighter, you know, and I, and I love that. And he developed it, crafted it into, like, its own thing. And, and we were all, like, you know, right. we're all in awe of how he did it. And especially back then, it wasn't like a tweet. It was like a guy waiting for you outside and he wants to punch you up. You know, like, that was definitely a tune-up time. So that's what I love about Rickles and how, like, the other acts would come down to see him because they knew it was so different. You know, like Frank Sinatra, all those guys would come and see him late, you know? They tell me back in the day, <clears throat> you know, he played Slate Brothers. Right. Is that the name of the place on La Cienega? That he had an act. Was, his act wasn't even insult comedy. It was, really? Really? It was impressions. Huh. I didn't know that. That, it, that that grew over time, probably as Dave says, from the crowd work. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think he would work strip clubs, so he would MC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he would sing, like, you know, people... Yes, yes, yes. Like, yes. He wanted to be an actor. That's yes. what I know. He, he went, he went to acting school. Yeah. yeah. And he, he, he was a showman. 
even even up into his 90s, he was had an orchestra on stage and he would do his uh, Yankee Doodle and he would do James Cagney impressions and he would tap dance and he would do he would bring people on stage and do a little like play acting. And a lot of it was he would improvise. I, uh, oftentimes I would get asked to speak at the same functions like, you know, friends would have big birthday parties and Don would speak and I would speak. And of course, Don would always speak last and he'd always tease me for being too prepared. Like I would write a roast, you know, John Stamos's 50th birthday. I wrote, I worked days on it. I wanted to do well. You know, John Stamos is so handsome the birthday candles blew him. (laughs) (laughs) And then Don would always tease me about like being prepared. He would always tease me, right, right. And and then ironically, I really learned to trust myself and not be so prepared that I could go off the cuff at a memorial for Don Rickles. his manager, Tony O, at the very last second said, will you say something? And handed me a microphone on a minute's notice. And I spoke about Don for a long time, very off the cuff emotionally. And and I loved him. He was, you know, he was like uh, the Pope of comedy. The kind of comedy he did was healing. It helped people laugh at themselves. It took race and gender and made it something not important, something to laugh about. And it bonded people. So... Shout out to Don Rick. Yes. And, Would have been, uh, I think, 92 this week. And performing till the end. And, oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I remember he lived old enough to start to get into that generation of being offended. Yeah. Right. And and he there was one joke that was all over the internet. How horrible. Don Rickles was talking about Barack Obama, and he says he's a friend of mine. He was over the house, but he had to leave early. His mop broke. <laughs> and <laughs> terrible joke. Everyone mm-hmm. got offended. I I remember thinking, you know, I'll bet you, if if the president heard that, he would have laughed. <laughs> I don't know about that. Did yeah. your dad pull a Don, pull a Sinatra on Don Rickles? Oh yeah. I was, when we were in, down at Borgata, I was thinking about that the other day. My dad loved to gamble in the eighties when they built Resorts International Casino down in Atlantic City. My dad was a regular and. There's that famous story where uh, Don tells on the Tonight Show. He goes over to Frank. You know, you tell it, and then I'll then I'll tell you. Well, he what goes my over to Frank did. and he says, "There's a girl I'm with, and I'm really trying to I'm really trying to make it with her, and it would mean a lot to me. It would really be great if you came over to the table really quickly and and said a quick hello." And Sinatra said, "No problem." That is that pretty much yeah. the setup. And then my and then when Frank went over, Don asked said, can't you see I'm with people? (laughs) So my dad heard that story on a Tonight Show. My dad was just a caterer from New Jersey who was enjoying Atlantic City and the gambling, and he would see Don Rickles at the same restaurant every month or so. My dad loved to go down there, and my dad's girlfriend at the time was also named Barbara, so he went over to Don and said, I really want to impress this chick when you go to the bathroom. Can you just wave and pretend you know me? My name's Ron. Her name's Barbara. So whether Don got got or he was just being a good sport, he did it. He came over to my dad's table and said, hey, Ronnie, is this Barbara you told me about? You know, <laughs> enjoy your meal. And my dad dropped his fork and said, Don, can't you see I'm eating? <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> my dad, you know, he loved that story forever. He loved comedy. Dave, I got a question for you. Yeah? Why did you say that every comic is a porn historian? Every comic is a porn historian? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that a thing? <laughs> you, said, you said that's it. Whatever. A, you were, you were giving an interview about Dave's porn collection. Well, I don't and know you if you said, know this, Frank. I've become a faith-based comic. So um, I'm not saying I didn't say it, but I'm saying I'm a different man. No, I think that uh, the vintage porn, which is the show that I did. Yes. Uh, the show I miss, porn, by the way. Yeah, that was on Showtime, and that was two seasons. Never had Jeff on it. No. Gilbert, you were on it, right? I, I, don't, it, no, I don't think so. Dave's old porn. I don't think porn. so. I'm not so sure, because yeah, uh, that was so. my favorite of all the projects I saw. Where is your old porn? What's that? I had it uh, when I moved. It was like basically. You ever see like a like um an eagle when the when the birds now are able to fly? It was like good luck. I had to let go of all that porn, <laughs> and I gave it to a mutual <laughs> friend. Set it free. A mutual friend, Dave, who uh, whose friend would uh, sell it on on the web, and I'm like, I don't even know if anybody has a DVD anymore. You know. Like, I'm the only guy with, like, 300 DVDs. You know, it's, like, pretty sad. But um, I really <laughs> loved doing that show. I liked tributing the old 
porn stars with both the new people in the business and also letting the comics see some of these really retro raunchy clips. So that was the beauty of it. And the comics, I think, since we have so much downtime, so much alone time, that um, porn does fill the void for a lot of us. Now, a lot of these younger comics, let's hit the gym. Let's, um, I don't know, play some, uh, you know, some game on online. Back then, it was really just porn. And, Vanessa uh, Del Rio and, and Erica, alcohol. Erica Boye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Christy Canyons lives in my neighborhood. She does. She was one of my favorites, honestly. So beautiful. Any of these names mean anything to you, Gilbert? No, not those. <laughs> Vanessa Del Rio. Okay, that that's more familiar. Okay. That's a local girl, by the way. Yes. Yes, Staten yes. Island, I Strong mean, Island. I, I remember when porn, there was that short period of time when they used to, sh they started showing porn in legitimate theaters. Yes, like the, the Exorcist. Last Tango in Paris? What? It was like when the Exorcist and the Behind yes. the Green Door time. Yeah. Like the, yeah. the late 70s. Devil yeah. and Miss Jones. Yep. yep. Or Screw on Screen was uh, one that Goldstein made. But, you know, when I think of those times, like, would I really stand online for, you know, double gaping anal? I don't think so. <laughs> like, you know, honey, I know it's raining out, but this is going to be good. <laughs> was a more innocent You got time, your man. money ready? We're almost at the box office. What was that show we talked about when we had you on in Gilbert's Kitchen? You were talking about a TV show that you loved as a kid. It was a, a an outer space show. Do you remember this conversation oh, we had? Jeez, I don't know. Gilbert knows all those great TV shows. Was it a Sid and Marty Croft thing or something like um, that? I have to go be. back and listen to the episode. But I will say this is that um, uh, I am doing a new show, and uh, Jeff probably... Uh, Probably talked about it a little bit, but I, I have my own new show that I'm doing. I'm excited for this because yeah. Dave's been working on this idea for, for a, a long, long time. time. And, you know, and I was asking maybe, you know, Gilbert, if you'd want to be on it because it's a new show. It's called Celebrity Hospice. <laughs> and it's people whose careers, <laughs> when people's careers die before they do, we let them go with a little dignity. Bump. And I, <laughs> thank you. Excellent setup, Jeff. <laughs> I gotta go pee. Can I go pee? Go pee. All right. Yeah. I'll hold the fort. Yeah, we'll stop. So now we can talk all sci-fi stuff. Gilbert, I didn't know you were a sci-fi fan. Did you watch yeah. the original Star Trek? No. You didn't like it. No. Are you a Twilight I, Zone guy, Dave? I love it. We yes. got we yeah. got Rod Serling's daughter coming here on Monday to talk about it. No way. About, all the way from Albany? Yes. Is that where she's from? Yes. I read that book about Rod Serling, and as a Jewish man, I really felt like, I want to be like Rod Serling, a chain-smoking World War II vet. Yes. Uh, <laughs> with a creative writing degree out of Syracuse University. I know a lot about him. I loved him. Yeah. yeah. And you're a Planet of the Apes fan, as we talked yes. about on the last show. Not which... the TV show Planet of the Apes. No. The real movies. I yes. loved it. Screenplay by Rod Serling. And all of the um, uh, Charlton Heston uh, uh, post-apocalyptic movies. Uh, Omega Man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. That's great stuff. Yes. yes, that was great. Did you, did you uh, and Soylent Green, of course. Yes, with Edward yeah, G. Robinson. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And, and, and then there was that other movie um, that was also Last Man on Earth with Vincent Price. Correct. That was the original Omega Man. Yeah. yeah. Story. That's what all these, like, you know... All these movies now about zombies and, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's what that's Richard about. Richard Matheson, I think. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And now, you know, I don't know what movies you guys watch, but, uh, you know, it's very difficult to watch. I assume with the kids, you got to, you know, watch a lot of these kids' movies, correct? Oh, yeah. And what... Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember the last time I was here, I was like, so what do you do with the kids? You And you said you wa make them watch these old monster movies. He does. He yeah, does. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, I, I bet you your kids are so popular at school. You, know, you want to talk about the mummy, the wolf man. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask how you, Amy Schumer just named her baby. Uh, yes. In part. Yeah, no, the middle name. The middle name. And uh, Amy's always been so good to me. So funny. And, and just like. You know, I was so excited when she was having the baby, and she said, "You know what? I want to, I want to, I want to um, name the baby. Uh, give give the baby your name." And I was like, "Okay, well, Dave is cool. You know, that's always pretty. You know, is another. You know, Dave's pretty. You know, middle of the road." She's like, "No, no, your last name." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> and you know, I felt bad for the baby, <laughs> but then I was like, "It's such a nice compliment. You know, how can I not?" You know, just take it as that because it's so sweet of her to it do is it. Sweet. But, you know, it really does kind of say, um, you know, uh, the best compliment I got was like, well, you know, that's good. So your name will live on, you know, because you're never going to have kids. I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> 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 
you know, so it's like it's either that or a bridge or a street, you know, like that's a boat, you know. So that was cool. And yeah, she's she's the best. Has she ever been on the show? We never had Amy. Oh, oh no. I think we so asked cool. her. I she think we she asked her. is so cool. When we used to tour around, like for a while there, uh, we did a great tour one time. It was me, Amy, Jim Norton. Artie, Jim, uh, Jim, we had Artie, Artie we Lang, had. and I think even Bill Burr was on one or two shows. And I always felt so bad for Amy because she was like, you know, this like she was the Marilyn, and we were the monsters, you know, oh, like these yes. old, these old grizzled comics, you know. And she held her own, and then some. She was great. So Amy is top notch. We should have her. Oh, where'd you get all the snacks? Oh, uh, Ross came back with snacks. How did you, <laughs> I didn't know you took a shuttle flight from... <laughs> that's like shuttle flight food. <laughs> Pretzels and a banana, a, an unripe banana. By the way, a very, a very flattering piece about you, Dave, in the Times. A well, couple of months you. ago, written by Jason Zinneman. Wrote a good book about the Letterman show. He was at the show... Uh, and I brought Amy on at Caroline's, and we and we and he was sitting right up front. I felt so bad for him because both Amy and I were like, that guy looks so familiar. Who is that guy? And we're like, I think he's a reporter. And then afterwards, we talked to him, and, and I and I said, <laughs> are you writing an article or something? He goes, I'm off duty. Don't worry about it. And then I guess there was a slow news week a couple months later, and he, and he banged that out. So tip of the hat to him, man. He is a true comedy fan, so I, I love that yeah. he came down. He knows his stuff. Himself. That was great. He, he was loves really that you nice. busted on him, too, that you, you called him Stephen sitting, Hawking stunt double. <laughs> yeah, he was sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> he was sitting there. I felt so bad for the poor guy. He was sitting up front like in the, one of those seats where you like – this poor guy doesn't know what he's up to. And then, like, I guess, you know, he just rolled with it, though. He just sat there. He was fine. Okay, real quick, before we get you guys out of here, I'm jumping around. I got a couple of questions for Dave from uh, listeners. Do you want to hear these, I got to go. You got to go? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Let's hear it. Okay. Uh, I love you guys. How did, how did you know? I might be able to First come back, all, but I got to take a phone call. Seriously? Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> an hour and a half. Wow. Um, wow. What would Milton so, Berle do? I think he would stay here. And I'll come back, but I gotta, I gotta, I gotta take it. How long is the call? I don't know. We'll this, find out. this is this is the first time. This since is the we've end of the comedy show where a guest said, "I gotta make a phone call." Yeah. Well, <laughs> and then left. Well, I have to take a phone call. This is also the first time you've had a guest who has an Anne Frank roast that just hit the Netherlands. Oh, <laughs> that's, what the call, yes. that's what the call's about? Yes, I have to take this call. <laughs> oh, you'd be surprised how many of those we've <laughs> All had. All right, you take the call. I'm going to ask Dave the questions that were meant for you. Gilbert, I just want to say I love you on behalf of Dave and myself. <laughs> Thank you for being a part of Bumpin' Mike's. You're a legend. Yes, you really you are. are. You are a legend. You have an open invite to be uh, on the stage whenever, however you want with us, because you complete us. You really do. Oh, thank you. That's so you. sweet. Try bump. Try bump. That's thank three you. in. That's so and, sweet. And, and thank Frank and Frank, good luck to you on your book about Pat McCormick or whatever you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I'm going to see you next week. You, I'm coming on the view. You're coming on the view. You'll be there. I will. Oh, I no, love of it. Of course. That and, sounds like a threat. And thank a threat. I thank the both of you for having me on Bumping Mics. Oh, that was a lot oh, of thank fun. You. And and I thank you, Jeff, for having me on the uh, To Be Hitler. <laughs> historical <laughs> notes. Historical roast. You're, you're, you, you, you instantly make it a classic. Before over. you go, give us the plugs again. Okay. And I'm going to make you read my fa one of my favorite Jeff Ross roast jokes. Oh, here it is. When I roasted Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons is such an asshole that his own asshole changed its name to Murray. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. I forgot about that one, Frank. Thank you. That's for a that. classic. Really? Yeah. I can plug our shows again? Go ahead. Oh, absolutely. This makes me so happy. Yep. I don't know what you guys are doing June 6th and 7th, but Dave and I will be at the Mirage in oh, Las Vegas. Oh, gee, I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to your audience. <laughs> June 6th and 7th. There's no better way to celebrate D-Day than <laughs> my anniversary. <laughs> June 6th. I've never played the Morongo before out in Cabazon, California. Have you? No, I haven't. June 14th. Dave and I will be there. And these shows, they're like events. Anything can happen. That's what we should have called it, the Anything Can Happen Tour. June 15th, we'll be at Harris in Southern California. Dave loves the casino shows because he can smoke in yeah, the elevator. Yeah, can smoke anywhere I want. He smokes in the elevator. I never saw a guy smoke in the uh, in the elevator before. And plug the Netflix show again. October fourth and fifth. I'm not done. Frank. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. We'll be in Dave's hometown. Huntington. Theater. Huntington Paramount Theater. It's Tickets on. are going fast. 
By the way, we had to add shows in some of these places. Oh, yes. one of them. great. We're doing great. And Give speaking to- of Canada, we're going to Winnipeg, October 20th. Yeah, take that. You know what? We should cancel that one. Why? <laughs> fucking go to Winnipeg. What, t- what time of year are we going? October. October. Awesome. Oh. Is there some kind of, um, I guess, Uber dog sled that you can suggest? <laughs> go over it. That could open for us down there. <laughs> Before we go, I want to say that Dave said one of the funniest things in the history of this show. Oh. Gilbert asked if he knew about Danny Thomas's fetish. And Dave said, <laughs> children's hospitals? <laughs> <laughs> and our listeners are still sh- talking about that 200 shows later. <laughs> Put a Shriner's cap on his head. And he- <laughs> Thank you, boys. Thanks for having us, guys. We love you both. Thank you. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre and <laughs> and our guest making it one of the easiest shows we've ever done. Oh. Jeff Ross and Dave Attell. Thank you. Thank you, boys. Bump Thank it you. up. Bump it Bump up. Bump it up. Everybody in. Frank, get in there. You, you want to you say anything about Abe Vigoda before you jump off? <laughs> Abe Vigoda's so old, his SAG number is three. <laughs> Good crap, man. Gilbert, we went to his funeral. Yeah, Gilbert yes. roasted him. Gilbert and I both um, memorialized him. Yep. Long live Abe Vigoda. I'm dedicating... Uh, October 4th in Huntington to Ava Goda. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, hard, hard promotion. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>